Welcome to the Living the Fed Life Podcast, episode 52. I'm your host, Chad Mueller, and today I'm hosted with Scott Mills, subbing in for Coach ADJ. Hey, Scott, how's it going, buddy? Great, great. Thanks for having me in. No problem. Yeah, and the reason why Scott has joined us on the, t- on the pod today, he recently took part in the Dark Horse Academy Coaching Certificate, which is the sort of coaching certificate for indoor rowing on the concept two. And I'm a huge fan of rowing, really excited to talk about that. And I'm super excited to have an, another awesome guest in the show, founder and owner of Dark Horse Academy, Shane Farmer. How's it going, Shane? Good, Chad. How are you, man? Hey, wait, did I hear that this is episode 52? Do you guys release weekly? Uh, every two weeks sort of no, thing. Oh, yeah. I thought I was going to get to be like the one year anniversary. One year. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, dude. Oh. Sorry, dude. Yeah, yeah, well, way to let me down early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my bad. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah i'm excited to be here thanks for having me awesome man appreciate it and yeah if anybody's not familiar with shane he's the creator and a face of dark horse rowing Ch- jump on youtube he's all over there uh shane's an avid rower obviously he you competed in the national championship for rowing yep. um then you found sort of crossfit and you competed as a team at the games right yeah 10 11 12 and 13 awesome awesome so yeah i'm super excited to sort of sit down pick your brain on obviously the topic of rowing we have a, our community is filled with CrossFit athletes, the weekend warriors, endurance folks. And so uh, rowing is something we actively do. And I think it'll be really cool to jump in and just talk about the rowing and your background and how dark horse is and, and what Scott's going to bring to our community. So yeah, really excited. Cool. Well, lead away, man. I'm here right. for it. So yeah. So um, obviously judging by your, your, your videos, your, your social accounts, like you're a pretty fit individual as, as rowing always sort of been sort of the center of your fitness. Uh, it, no, no, it hasn't been, um, I'm a very diverse sport background athlete. So, uh, you came out of through high school, I played, you know, every sport I could get my hands on and, um, was a 12 season athlete in high school and middle school back in the day, but I'm from Minnesota. So for me, it was, uh, football, baseball, track and field, uh, and Alpine skiing. So I actually raced slalom for eight years. Um, and swapped baseball for track after my sophomore year. I was such a slow runner that I was like, <laughs> well, you could always tell when I was on the base path. Cause I ran like duck footed, my feet were pointed out. So you could always see like my foot path on the, on the dirt. And I was so slow and I was like, well, I guess the only way to get faster is to run track, which was a miserable. Like, I was like, I know I'm going to be miserable doing this. Cause I'm a terrible runner and I'm going to have to learn, uh, but that was the choice I made then. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, that was like my foundation of sport was just everything, every ball sport I could get into and skiing and, and all that. And then went to college in Colorado for two years, played club baseball there, mm-hmm. uh, and then transferred to the University of San Diego and found rowing once I got there. All right. I just happened to have a knack for endurance sports, apparently. Uh, and my body was built a little bit long and lanky and I have big thighs, which is kind of like the ideal for a rower's body. So mm-hmm. I'm six, three. Um, and I just kind of fell into it, fell in love with it, but CrossFit was our strength training while I was rowing. And so okay, I, was cool. to, yeah, I was introduced to CrossFit in 2006, my second year of college at USD. And, oh, um, you're an OG then. That, yeah. 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 <laughs> if you, if you know the name, Stefan Roche, uh, I've heard he, the name. He is an OG, he, like before he was the, one of the original level one flow masters. Um, cool. and he was our S and C coach at USD. And so he turned our, our collegiate S and C facility into a CrossFit gym before CrossFit was cool. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there were all of probably 20 in the world at the time. And, um, so we discovered it really early and we, as like a team fell in love with CrossFit. So I, I had this like early exposure to CrossFit. Plus I had rowing then roll into like post-collegiate life. And I didn't, I was too small to be a heavyweight and too heavy to be a lightweight in the world of rowing. And so i moved into CrossFit because I knew of it and found Invictus, which just happened to be a great gym at the time, um, which I knew nothing about. It just happened to be the closest gym to me and Mm -hmm. then started moving into CrossFit, started coaching in that world. So to answer your question, that was a very long winded (laughs) way of getting at like the core of my fitness revolves around, um, I would say just the principles of human movement that I've learned throughout the years. Mm -hmm. Um, I pride myself on being a coach first, 
and a rowing coach second. So, cool. uh, you know, while I've been become known as the rowing guy, I'm as comfortable coaching Olympic weightlifting as I am coaching rowing, um, gotcha. because I grew up in Invictus Sage, Cody and coach Bergner were all my Olympic weightlifting coaches. And wow. yeah, like I've, you know, Kelly Starrett was my mobility coach and Carl Pally was my gymnastics coach and OPT was dropping into Invictus all the time back in the day. And I com com competed at the first optathlon, which you probably don't know what that is, but, uh, before he became OPEX, he was OPT. And when he was OPT, he hosted the optathlon, which was like his, mm -hmm. you know, determination of fitness. So yeah, that's fitness is broad and diverse, uh, and rowing just happens to be a sliver of it. Yeah. No wonder why you're a great coach. Those are some, those are some awesome coaches to have in the space. I was very lucky. Like some of the best. Yeah. It, it was an incredible, um, it was an incredible opportunity to just be brought up around some amazing coaches and, you know, CJ Martin to his credit fostered an environment where um, he was bringing these specialists in because he had personal relationships with them. And so mm -hmm. these guys would just drop into our facility for a weekend and host seminars with just us coaches and every single coach at Invictus back in the day had to have a specialty. So yeah. I hosted rowing and then we had, you know, Sage was coaching Olympic weightlifting and we had a gymnastics coach and we had a nutrition coach and we had a powerlifting coach. And so every base was covered and we would teach each other as we went through. And so you could do a six month cycle under, you know, Sage and learn as you went. And so it was just this, it fostered this really incredible, um, learning environment. I almost like liken it to a, an apprenticeship. Um, yeah. you know, I had for probably two years, I couldn't put a program in front of a client without CJ looking it over first, asking me questions. Why did you do this? Why did you put that before that? Did you think about the way that these things are paired together? So that, I mean, that was the, the world that I came up in from coaching. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, that's cool. I didn't know that. That's really, really cool. Yeah. So then I guess I'm sure you've been asked this question. I know you were kind of touching on it, but like, how did, so, so when did you transition to dark horse rowing? Like, how did that become a thing for you to jump into? Why did you decide that niche specifically? Well, the rowing part came about very naturally. Um, I, I came out of college, obviously I was really fresh out of college and I went and got a job with a suit and a tie selling life insurance and hated my life. You've probably heard that, you know, I've told that story a million times. Um, and I made it like nine months, but I had, I had done well enough in that nine months that I had like enough to live on for the next six months. So I was like, all right, well, I'm miserable in my day job. Um, but I was a member at this CrossFit gym and I saw this gap of knowledge between a ton of rowing being used, but nobody was talking about it. Nobody. I mean, I wasn't seeing blog articles. The CrossFit main site wasn't really talking about it. Concept two was kind of the only one putting out any mm -hmm. kind of content. Um, and so I jumped without a parachute. I had like quit my job and I was like, well, I guess I better figure it out what my next step is. And very naturally ended up like going to CJ and saying, Hey, I'm seeing a ton of rowing, but nobody's doing it right. Could I teach it to you guys? And he made me teach to the coaches first, which was terrifying because I was a, you know, 22 year old with no coaching background. And so to like figure out how to break down the rowing stroke for a bunch of coaches who were professional coaches was terrifying. Uh, but I got it through and he gave me the, the check mark to like, go ahead and start coaching to the gym. So I started doing that and that just kind of rolled mm -hmm. into it. Um, mm -hmm. I started coaching rowing six months later, one of the coaches got pregnant. So I started coaching CrossFit. Um, they sent me to get my level one and then it just kind of kept going from there. I started taking on clients and coaching group classes and ramping up the rowing class. And then like the real breaker for me, I met my now wife. She was a member at the gym. Didn't date for, my, for the record. I never once dated another member at the gym. She was the only one. So I made good on my <laughs> promise not to like, <laughs> you know, date the members. Uh, <laughs> well, um, this is for real. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, met my now wife and we long story short, booked this trip to Europe together after having known each other, like uh, just a couple months, it was a real dangerous choice. 
And uh, it was like a make it or break it, you know, what could, what could possibly go wrong? We barely know each other. Let's go to Europe together. Uh, but so she was going and I couldn't afford it. Cause I was on a, you know, measly coach's salary at the time. Um, this is like before the advent of like coaches making a living wage, you know? <laughs> and yep. so I, uh, I was like, well, I, she paid, I think she paid for my, my plane ticket because she had student loans from, she was in law school at the time. So she's like, I've got the money you know, loaned to her, but she, she buys my plane ticket. And I'm like, well, I better figure out how to pay this back real quick. Uh, and so I put together a one page PDF. Um, I don't remember who I was at the time. I was like talking to anybody and everybody who would have coffee with me about like figuring out how to kind of grow my career. And somebody recommended it. They're like, you can, you can be an expert. You just have mm -hmm. to tell people you're the expert. And I was like, Hmm, that's interesting. So I used like Apple pages, I think was like the yeah. designer back then. So I put together this one page PDF that was a rowing seminar, but I didn't even have the outline for the seminar. I just put together a like one day seminar and I emailed it to every single CrossFit gym that I could find in Europe at the time. And this is 2011. And that was all of like, you know, 25 CrossFit gyms across like mainland Europe. And uh, one gym picked it up CrossFit Le Mans in Switzerland. And so they said, yep, we'd love to have you. Um, and I was like, great. The price is exactly the price of my plane ticket. What a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, like, that was how I really kicked things off. Um, we got to Europe, we took the trip and then we parted ways. I flew to Switzerland and, uh, hosted my first seminar. And I wrote my outline on the plane from the <laughs> South of France to yes. Switzerland. Like I wrote the lesson plan, uh, as I was flying. And then came back from that trip and concept two had somehow heard about it. And so when I got back to Invictus, there was a call waiting for me from concept two. And they said, Hey, our, our head coaching position for CrossFit rowing is open. Uh, we haven't seen anybody else teaching this. Uh, our head coach is retiring or she'd like to at the time it was Angela Hart. And do you want the job? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and so then I went to work uh, head coach in the CrossFit running program. Um, and then um, things just continue yeah. to go from there. And then it, we reached a point where I was traveling so much for concept two, and I had opened a, a rowing facility in Houston. Um, it, this is before row house existed. We had this idea for a rowing studio and we did it. We opened it in Houston. These two guys had lined up investors and a business plan, but knew nothing about rowing. And so they brought me in as a partner we opened it, which meant that I had to be in Houston a lot. So I left Invictus at the time and, um, which was nice. It was an amicable parting. I just needed to be there more often than I could support my clients. And after that kind of played itself out that experience, uh, I was like, well, I mean, I'm still here and I'm not just going to mm -hmm. be working for concept two. And I needed to figure out how to put content out in a better way. Cause I couldn't coach through blog articles anymore. It was, mm -hmm. we're evolving. You know, the world was blog article coaching back in the day and pictures and blogs, and it, yeah. it just wasn't working. So I started creating videos and that really like when the videos started was when dark horse really started. That was 20, 2015. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Like, and like the rowing, like, have you noticed the rowing community? Like how, like how much has the rowing community really grown? Cause I mean, rowing is not really, I wouldn't call it a new sport by any means. Um, I guess concept two has been around for quite a while. Like, have you noticed that the rowing community really grow over the past, like 10, 20 years? It depends on how you classify the rowing community. Cause indoor rowing, rowing I guess, is... indoor rowing versus outdoor rowing. That's the two different. Yeah. 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 Uh, so on water rowing is, uh, they, they are struggling. They're struggling to find their way and, and like really understand their relevance in, as a modern day sport with, um, you know, attention span and, like how much of a viewership there is behind rowing. Cause it's a tough sport to watch. Um, mm. you stand on the shore for right. <laughs> you know five minutes for a race to pass you by for 30 seconds and then they're gone. And so like, it's not super spectator friendly. And, um, there's talk of like rowing being cut for the Olympics. And so it, it, there, there's a bit of like unsurety happening there, uh, mm -hmm. in the on water rowing world. Indoor rowing, I mean, it's exploded and I, I kind of sensed it coming, which is why I've stuck with it as long as I have. 
Um, and that just the advent of the number of connected rowing machines. I mean, in my garage here alone behind me, I have six different rowing machines. And that's not even all of the connected rowing machines in the space, but I have a hydro, an ergata, a city row, a whipper, a techno gym, concept two, and there are still more that, that I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, indoor rowing has absolutely exploded. It was, especially during the pandemic, it's an easy yeah. choice. Yeah. You know, I want one piece of equipment that's going to do it all for me. Well, it's a compound movement that requires the majority of your body in order to execute the movement properly. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty easy choice. Um, and and do you, machine. I was going to ask you about that. Um, because obviously, yes, you're right. During COVID, you know, Peloton, hydro assault bikes, like road bikes, all these sort of individual machines sort of exploded when people were trying to get, you know, fitness in their home. Yeah. How, how would you compare an indoor rower versus those other things? Is it really the full body sort of workout? That's your really, that's how you would compare the difference to any of those other machines. Yeah. I mean, if you, it, let's compare it to like any kind of cycling activity, right? We can even throw in, in any kind of air bike in there. Mm -hmm. So assault or, um, uh, what's the original I'm blanking on the, I think it's called air runner, isn't it? No. Or the airdyne? Airdyne. Airdyne. The airdyne. Yeah. So, you know, any kind of air bike, we can throw that in there. Like for the most part, it guides you through the movement. Mm -hmm. You add in an assault component and well, all right, you at least get like a push pull of the upper body, but there's very little complexity to your kinesthetic awareness required on the mm -hmm. machine. So it's a very passive machine in that sense. And it becomes completely a suck factor machine. <laughs> Like there, there is no skill involved other than just your ability to maintain high heart rate, high respiratory rate. That's Maybe. essentially your limiter, right? What kind of, what's your RPM? Can you control yeah, you can't your screw RPM? that one up? No. Right. Yeah. I mean, like you, the real test is just how much suffering are you willing to undergo? Right. Which is great. I, I'm not faulting them for that. But if we talk about, if we're talking about like the complexity of the movement itself, you look at something like a skier or a rower. Well, now there's a high requirement for skill involved. So there is a mental connection. You have to create this mind body connection to the movement and the machine can push back, but there are also variables that you're able to control. So like in a salt bike, you can basically just scale intensity from zero to a hundred up and down. That's all you get. Whereas with rowing, you can vary intensity in different ways. You can control stroke rate. You can control output. Um, you can work on power, like these variables are usable when we get to, let's call it skier and rower. So, um, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that rowing is like, you know, the end all be all of fitness, right. But it's a pretty damn good form of fitness, mm -hmm. right? Like it, to, if you had to select one machine, I mean, it's probably pretty good yep. for that. To accomplish a lot of different things that makes sense and 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 you know at low injury yeah right very low risk very low risk yeah and you even so, get less repetitive stress because you are required to move your body through space and time on the machine whereas like if you set up your bike improperly or if your seat's too far forward on an assault bike like you may end up with a repetitive stress injury because your knees are in poor position you've put yourself too far forward and so you create just this repetitive stress on that one joint over and over and over. Whereas with rowing, you are learning and feeling and adapting as you go. And so there are adjustments that happen that usually help to stay away from more of those repetitive stress injuries, not saying they don't occur, but mm -hmm. I think the likelihood is less. Yeah. And how do you, so how do you, so you do cross, like, how do you fit rowing into your fitness routine on a weekly uh -huh. basis? Are you That's a great question? <laughs> Rarely, okay. uh, because you know, when, when something becomes your, like your life, my entire business is built on this. Like I, uh -huh. I've erged enough in my life that I'm <laughs> imagine like loving running, but everybody gets to know you because you're like the treadmill guy. Yeah. You know, like I love rowing the sport, but for, I just was in, a, uh, I competed in a regatta I don't know, a month and a half ago now. Um, so I was in a boat, we were training leading up to it. So I had about three months where I was getting on the erg two times a week, three times a week. I was still choosing to ride my bike erg a lot. Yeah. And I was preferring that for just getting my aerobic fitness up. But at a certain point, you do have to just get in rowing shape. Um, right. So 
I love rowing the sport on water. It's beautiful. It's harmonious. It's peaceful. It's intense. And it's very rewarding. You go out for these early morning rows, you get to watch the sunrise, you feel the wind in your hair, like water splashing. It's very visceral. Mm -hmm. Um, there's this like beautiful, there's so many sounds that come with rowing that are so satisfying to hear on the water that it's hard not to love the poetry of the motion. And so it's very complex in that sense. Erging for me, I've done enough of it and, and I can find fitness in a million different ways. I don't need to sit on the same machine and do the same thing over and over and over because I know I can come back to it if I need it. I prefer yeah. to explore my fitness. So for example, in uh, not this weekend, but next weekend, I'm doing a 16 mile ruck race, um, cool. up in the, the hills above, um, Malibu. Uh, so that's a massive undertaking. So I've been spending a ton of time on my feet lately. I've been getting three to four runs a weekend, varying with my ruck weights and, and not. So like Friday, I had a nine mile, 1700 foot gain, uh, trail run by myself with a 25, well, it was probably 30 plus pounds after all was said and done. Um, so like that was my training that day. Okay. Prior to that, I was doing a ton of unilateral leg strength work. Um, so I was on almost exclusively, I was doing a, a four or five day a week program with Ryan Fisher's programming. Um, so it, it really just varies throughout the year. It depends on what I want to work on. Sometimes I'll use uh, bodybuilding programs. Sometimes mm -hmm. I will spend a ton of time on the biker just because I'm loving the experience on there. It really varies. Cool. Cool. So you're, you're a guy that likes kind of dipping into a lot of different methodologies and variety and keeping variety sort of a priority. Yeah. Because, yeah. I, because yeah. I appreciate the wonder of the human body. Mm -hmm. I love the exploration of it. And so it's not a, like, I jump from thing to thing because I, well, I mean, I do get bored, but like, I love the, like, what is my body capable of? What yeah, can totally. I spin up and learn how to do? And, um, what can I accomplish? So in June, early June, like I'm going back to run, um, I think they say it's like North America's first trail race, the Dipsy. If you've okay. heard of it or not, um, it's a 7.2 mile double peak, 2000 foot elevation gain race. And I ran it for the first time last year. Uh, it's up in Marin County in uh, Northern California. And I qualified last year. So I earned a spot into the invitational division this year. So I'll be doing that again. Um, just cause I want to see, like, I'm, I have no expectations of how I'm going to perform, but I do love to go out there and just test myself and see yeah. what's, see what's possible. No, I, I totally relate to that. I just finished a hypertrophy program uh, and I was in doing CrossFit before that and, uh, and I did hypertrophy, which is kind of fun. Now yeah. jumping back to the CrossFit. And I think our, our community, you know, we have a lot of individuals that are sort of multi-sport fitness athletes, if you want to call them, they're endurance athletes in the summer and then they do sort of CrossFit. And, and so keeping that sort of, you know, testing your fitness is definitely something uh, I can relate to for sure. Because it is cool trying different types of protocols. It yeah. is cool. Yeah. yeah. And you, you learn stuff about yourself and you learn yeah. the mentality behind other coaches programming and their thinking. And you can sit there when you're in it and you're like, why did they do that? Mm -hmm. And yeah. you can, you know, come to your own conclusions about it. And instead of just following a program blindly, you're like, oh, that's interesting. I'd never thought of pairing two things that way or, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. aligning those elements. Cool. I did want to dive into more about dark horse and sort of the program itself. Like how do how would you explain sort of the foundations of the program? Like who's it targeted to? Like what is the rowing program that you put together? So we target the, we'll call them the new to social rower. Okay. Um, they're a new mover or they are new to the rower. We, there's nobody in the world that can get you more comfortable on the rower faster than we can. Hands down. That's the one thing in this world that I can say for sure. Um, I could, you know, if I, if I had you one-on-one -on -one in 45 minutes, I could have you to a comfortable place where you're like, oh, huh, okay. Like there's yeah. still plenty of practice mm -hmm. that has sure. to come, but like through movement and just that work together, I can very confidently get you there. Uh, and then from there, we, so that person kind of comes in the form of like, you've chosen to have a singular machine at home. So you bought a rower. 
I don't care what brand it is. We're pretty agnostic in that sense. And that rower lives in your spare bedroom, your garage, your hallway, your basement, wherever it may be. And you explore fitness in that way at home. Um, likelihood that you also have some kind of external fitness, whether it's a CrossFit gym or a 24 hour Globo gym or whatever it may be. Um, we also have a decent amount of injured athletes that come to us to use the rower as a result of no longer being able to do their chosen mm -hmm. sport, at least for a period of time or perhaps forever. Um, so that's kind of who we serve. And once you reach the point of like competitiveness, currently we don't serve that audience. Once you reach a level where you're like, Hmm, I really want to dig in. Uh, you, most people will at that point go through our Academy, which Scott, that's what, what yep. you've gone through. So, um, that's the like, all right, deep dive time mm -hmm. where I, I'm good at this socially. Like I get it. I'm decently fit. I don't have the same questions that I used to of just like the basics. How do I learn? What's my next step? Well, that's generally when somebody moves into the Academy. And from there, um, we're actually working on building uh, what that next stage looks like for somebody. So you know, Scott, you can get excited because there, <laughs> there will be more to come beyond the Academy, uh, because we've spent so much time really building the foundation for those new learners to come in. Now it's time for us to show that, you know, we have the depth of knowledge. Like we are, we can take you full scale in this world. Yep. Um, you know, like we, we coached the, uh, for the last three years, my head coach has coached the, uh, world champion gig rowers. So if you know what gig rowing is, it's a British based, uh, rowing sport. That's like old wooden boats with like, they're, they're huge. Um, and the the guys that have won the last three years running, we've been coaching them. So like programming wise, we've got the scale, right. And we can yeah. go up and down that scale as needed. Cool. And so like for, for that person, that newish person, uh, you know, maybe they're new to CrossFit and they jump in and they, there's a Metcon and it's got rowing in it. They sit on the row and they're just, they just start pulling. They're like, this was fun, but don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. How do I guess is, do you guys think about how do you fit rowing into a person's routine? Maybe they go to the gym like three times a week for some strength based stuff. And then they kind of have a machine at home or they want to go into their box and kind of just sit in the rower for a bit. Like, do you guys sort of prescribe like how many times to sit on the rower? Do you do long, short? Do you guys have that, like, do you have sort of a, a preferred sort of thought for that sort of newish person? Yeah. And because, I mean, you're, you're, I feel like I fed you that question. Um, because of my background with coaching, like I was so into CrossFit for so long when I started writing programs, my assumption was that nobody was going to want to be on a rowing program five days a week. Like, right. People don't like this machine. <laughs> right. I, I'm very open about that. Like, I don't expect you to love it. And frankly, I'm not trying to convince you to love it. Like right. I get to be the rowing guy for people who hate rowing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, under the assumption that you hate rowing, how can I get you to the point of comfort without making you feel like you're losing that sense of the things that you do enjoy doing? So all of our, every single one of our programs was written with a two day a week mindset mm -hmm. intended to be complementary to whatever your primary program was and not to overcome that program. So if you go into any of our programs, we have a library and then we also have daily workouts, you know, which is pretty common nowadays that include rowing plus body weight. And we tell you what to do on your recovery days. And we take you through, you know, stretching routines and whatnot. Um, but in all of our programs, they were all written as two day a week programs. We've since added the three other days, but yeah. those are optional. So I know that if you follow my 2k program and though, and do those two workouts a week for eight weeks, you will get faster at your 2k. Yeah. I, I guarantee it. If you do five, well, you'll get even faster. Uh, but if you do like, if it's minimum dosage two a week, we'll get you there. And so, yes, we programmed with that in mind. Chad, I don't know if you know, it's like you say you hate the machine. People hate the machine in the gym. What I see is people take a look at the rower in a wad and it's like their rest station. Yeah. Like they, they want to take it easy for X number of K as opposed to people choosing that machine. If they really want to, you know, get some pain. It's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's true. Yeah. And that's because of the, the like black hole 
understanding of what of what happens in the rowing movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you you're either like indifferent to it, <laughs> or you detest it because you're like, well, I get on this machine, something happens, stuff comes out. I don't know what the something <laughs> happens piece is, and so because I don't know what's happening there, it, you like have to make a snap judgment. Yeah. Like this is my rest station because I don't understand how to work hard on it, or my body can work hard, but I don't understand why I'm getting bolts I'm getting. And so you're like, Oh, I hate this thing. Cause it's just, yeah. it sucks everything from me, but I don't understand why. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I have to ask this question. And I mean, Scott, you can answer it too. Like, what is, what is the one biggest thing someone should know to be proficient on the rower? Because it's like, if you do know rowing and you break it down, there are a lot of it is very technical, just like anything like running is technical. Anything, be, anything can be technical. If you so choose to dive into it with rowing for that person that jumps into the CrossFit wad and they have to row a thousand meters. Like what is the one thing that you would tell that person the first time they're using it or the first five times they're using it? Scott, damn you. I want, I want to hear your answer. <laughs> So I, I, I'll, I'll tell you what my aha moment was on the rower. It was when I really got my head around the fact that rowing is a pushing motion, not a pulling motion. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea that my job is to trying to push that machine away from me as opposed to pulling the handle. And where it really made a connection for me was comparing it to a deadlift. So if you, if you think about a deadlift, you know, you need a flat foot you know, you need to push off that. Uh, you're not going to try and pull that deadlift with your hands, you know, or with your, your, your back muscles. And so when people can figure out that it is a pushing exercise first, I think once you get that little piece, I think the rest are easier to get people to understand. I would agree with that. I think that, <laughs> that because we, we talk about that in, in the, the course as, I mean, if you can make that singular paradigm shift with somebody, you can at least have some aha moments for people where they're like, mm -hmm. wait, I've been trying to pull. And, and I mean, Chad, what does every coach in your gym scream at somebody when they want them to go faster on the rower? Pull, pull harder, hard, pull harder, yeah, pull yeah. harder. Yeah. Right. You're like, we're planting the wrong seed in people's brains mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because just kinesthetically, when you think pull, you almost always think pull with your arms. Right. So if I say pull harder, I'm already ruining somebody's potential to understand the, the mechanics of the stroke, how, how to get better at this thing. Yes. Instead, if we can teach somebody like push that machine away from you with your legs, put like push, like your life depends on it. Try to push that rower across the room. Mm -hmm. If that's the way that we could get coaches. I mean, if we could just make that one coaching change, yeah, you know, yeah. CrossFit wide, uh, I think we'd see a lot of adaptation start yeah. to happen. It, it, you, well, you even you even see it during a wad when you know the coach will acknowledge perceived effort, right? That, that yes. they walk by and they see what you're doing and they think you're working hard. Someone yes. else could be really slow and slow and efficient. They think they're slacking off when really it's only the machine that will tell you how hard that person's working. Hundred percent. Yeah, because if we uh, like the the feedback that I consistently get when you drop me into any CrossFit gym and like. I love to drop into group classes. Just it's fun. You know, I, mm -hmm. I love to go get exposure and just be, uh, be an athlete. Sometimes I off, I, I love it, frankly, when I get to drop into a CrossFit gym that where I don't know anybody, because I just get to drift to the background. Nobody's like, you know, yeah. like let's put rowing into today's workout <laughs> so we can talk to Shane about it. I'm like, no, please don't. Uh, but if rowing happens to be in there, there's always this, like, inevitably there's a comment, like you hardly looked like you were working. Like, how'd you get done so quick? It's like, well, because you don't have to look like you're working hard. Like if you understand right. how, how, again, the mechanics of how this thing works, you can create a very fast output with a lot less effort. It doesn't have to look hard. You can make it look smooth and still be going fast. Yeah. If uh, I'll just keep going here for a second. I, like, I like the, the in the gym part. I remember my first day at the gym. Um, you know, I had an orientation session we didn't really talk about the rowing machine, you know, in the orientation. And that's not a criticism because there's only so much you can cover, but I'm thinking that's an opportunity for the gym owner. I just don't know how to apply it is how do you get the broad membership 
you know, to understand that piece of equipment, because I think, you know, it might only be in for 20 calories, you know, you know, on the wad one day. And I just don't know if it gets the time and attention. I, I believe the solution comes in number one in those onboarding sessions, right? If we, if we have an on-ramp class, which almost every CrossFit gym does, um, through an on-ramp, if you can, if you can bring the point to the front of the education that we believe in understanding human movement and skill, rowing falls under that. You don't have to like teach rowing in the first two weeks. You can accomplish it at a later point. But by emphasizing that we are a high-skilled gym, we believe in learning how the human body moves. Therefore, there will be times where other movements are brought to the forefront and used as a primary for you know, a certain program. Hey, for the next eight weeks, in our general programming, we're going to be emphasizing rowing. And mm-hmm. then you get a two-week window where every coach although that requires that every coach understands how to move on the machine, right? Mm -hmm. Opportunities for, for coaches to come through the academy because that teaches them how to use it as a coach, not as a, as a student, but more so as a coach. Um, But that's an opportunity to get touch points every single day in small ways without overwhelming a client. So 15 minutes of work, 10 minutes of work can produce significant results. You just have to know what that minimum effective dose is and what your path should be. What's the thing we need to focus on today? Well, let's make the warm up of today's group workout a two minute catch hold drill mm-hmm. times two. Mm-hmm. You're going to have some very unhappy members, but they're going to be warm and you're going to get a lot of knowledge that, hap- that occurs from that. Yeah. Right. It's so like, Scott, you've been through the two minute catch hold. Like, it's not fun. It, uh, actually, I did that with the group I'm coaching uh, two weeks ago. Uh, it was a very uncomfortable two minutes. There was lots of shaking going yeah. on. Uh, yeah. I, of course, learned. just observed. I didn't have to do it. Right. Yeah, naturally. <laughs> of course. So, Although, so it's, it's that. Like, I think that's how you, you get it through into a system like that. And then yeah. you offer new offerings. I think a lot of CrossFit gyms are like, well, we're a CrossFit gym. And so that's our offering. It's like, well, but why, why not offer an endurance class? a separate endurance offering that where you do use rowing for a quarter and then you switch to running and then you switch to bikes and then you switch to whatever equipment the the facility has. Yeah. And I I think that it's, it's, that's again, a challenge for the, for the affiliate owner where, you know, rowing usually is, you know, it's, it's how quick can you row, you know, 400 meters in the middle of the water, how quick can you bang out, you know, 30 calories, you know, in that 45 to 50 minute class, they don't get a chance to explore, you know, doing a 2k or doing a a 2k, 3k split where, you know, it's the 5k, but also we're going to score your 3k in the middle. Um, And so there's a whole piece of, I think of, of rowing that the average member will never get to benefit from Yep. Mm -hmm. without a specialty program. Right. Yeah. It's very hard to improve if the only time you're ever on the machine, you're asked to give hundred percent and nothing less. That's not a coachable environment. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Chad, do you mind if I keep going here? Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, so, uh, Wednesday night, we're going to do the damper, the, the damper setting, you know, test. Nice. And, and so pretty much, and I actually overheard this in the gym a few weeks ago when a, a member was saying, you know, what damper should I put it on? And another member said, well, 10 is harder. Um, yes. And, and I think that's the perception, um, right? 10 is harder in that at most machines, you know, as you go move the peg down, it gets heavier. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what, what would you say to the people who aren't going to take the rowing class when it comes to damper setting? Yeah. This is probably the biggest question you get has to be. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, damper. Well, the thing is like damper setting is a myth. Uh, it's, it's simply an adjustment of whether the machine feels light or heavy. However, the amount of, the amount of work that's put into a machine is completely determined by the athlete themselves. Case in point, I can row very easy at a 10. So just because I'm at a 10, I can row a three minute split at a 10. I can also row a one thirty split that right there is the answer to why a damper setting is not the determinant of work. Mm -hmm. 
it's <clears throat> so I, I personally, I love the answer of, well, how hard are you willing to work? Okay. What damper setting should I use? Well, I'm going to put it at a five. You tell me how hard you're willing to work. Cause mm -hmm. that's the thing that's going to show us whether or not you're willing to, to put in the effort or not, because you can cruise at a 10. You don't have to work hard. Um, essentially the, the short mm -hmm. answer to mm -hmm. it though, is that a 10 simply allows more air into the flywheel and yeah. therefore it spins slower. It takes more effort to get the flywheel up, but so it creates a bit more of a muscular fatigue versus an aerobic, uh, an aerobic strain. You put it down to a one, there's less muscular fatigue, but there's higher aerobic strain. And you also have to adjust the way that your body is reacting. So you take it down to a one, you also need to have a high demand for that fast twitch environment. You take it up to a 10, it's very slow twitch. Endurance athletes love a 10 on the rower because there's no requirement on their body to have to have that quick stimulus and that fire. Sorry mm -hmm. if that pop was really loud in the, in the microphone, but the point being endurance athletes tend to gravitate to a 10. You're like deconditioned athletes who don't know how to have that like explosive, really quick poppy movement. Love a 10 because it's very forgiving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas when you, the better a rower gets, if you look at the world of rowing, the better rowers get, the lower the damper setting comes because they don't want to have to like grind every stroke. They'd rather mm -hmm. be able to finesse every stroke. Mm -hmm. So the better you get, it's very natural that your, your damper setting just comes down because you understand how to have a fast twitch at the catch, how to lock your body in quickly. You're not searching for positions. You're not, you know, it, it's, it's like uh, jump roping, for example. The better you get at jump roping, the shorter your cable gets because there's less room for error. There's mm -hmm. less weight to carry in the jump rope. Mm -hmm. And so you get really efficient. And all of a sudden you understand how to lock your elbows into your side and how to snap at the wrists, as opposed to like these big forearm based movements for jump roping, you spend less effort. You can do more without having to. Yeah. I find the high. technique, I, I find the technique too. Like oftentimes when you, I jump in the rower, like I like, like a three or a four and I'm always pushing it down. I'm six, five. So I'm a decent rower by nature. And it's always at eight or nine. And I find that the technique of someone that's rowing at eight or nine is usually they probably, they just don't look like it's easy. Right. It just looks like, again, going back to pushing versus pulling, right. Mm -hmm. The damper kind of makes it feel like pulling is the answer. And so I'm just pulling heavier. So I'm going further or getting more energy. And usually if you watch that stroke, it's usually led by a knock back of the head as the first initiation of the movement followed by the shoulders. You get this like falling stroke, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which if you put that person vertically and you put a PVC pipe into their hands and told them to do the same thing, they would just be falling backwards. There would be no actual strength put into, you know, what would be a PVC pipe deadlift mm -hmm. because they don't, they're, they essentially are, are forgetting that there is this requirement for your midline to actually stabilize against the weight. Mm -hmm. Usually there's a an, an lack of understanding kinesthetically how to create resistance on the handle. Mm -hmm. And so the, that's why 10 is so satisfying for somebody is because you can get resistance without having to create it. And yeah. so you can lead with your head, you can lean your head back, you can throw your shoulders back first, and it just gives you resistance. You don't have to actually work for it. The problem is that those are incorrect mechanics. And so you can get work done without risk of injury. However, could you be getting more work done? Absolutely. If I sat next to you, I'd probably be getting more work done with less effort. Mm -hmm. And so it's very forgiving up at a 10 mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What I, I note here that I made for myself is, you know, we look at a lot of the, the, the movements in a, in a typical CrossFit gym and, and you can apply them outside of the gym. You don't need a piece of equipment. And I'm wondering if you agree with this is that, you know, some people won't take the rowing, you know, maybe as serious because it's the only time they do that movement where if like an exercise bike, they could go for a bike on the weekend with their kids. You know, if it's mm -hmm. running base, they could go for a run if they're, you know, lifting weights, but I'm wondering what your comment is. What I'm wondering is how do I get members to get more interested in mastering rowing even though it's likely the only time they're going to use it is at the gym. If it's programmed into the wad. A good way to address that is that 
it's a it's a no risk option for improving your aerobic capacity. Do you want to mm -hmm. be able to improve your aerobic capacity so that you can go on bike rides, go on long hikes, walk with your family, be able to do whatever you want without having to risk injury? Well, rowing is a great option for that. Yeah, of course, you're never going to go rowing. The other piece of that is try not to tell them that they're, they need to love rowing. You know, it doesn't have to be a rowing class. Make it an endurance class. Just that the syntax of that alone improves somebody's capacity to be able to say, okay, yeah, I'll come do that. It's an endurance class. Well, yeah, it is an endurance class. You mm -hmm. just happen to use rowing as the tool to improve endurance. Great. If I say, come join the rowing club, people are like, ah, no, thanks. I don't need <laughs> rowing. <laughs> You're like, come join the endurance club. People are like, no, nah, no, thanks. I don't need endurance. Right. Like that's a, that's a much easier, oh, like that's a, a, an easier challenge to overcome. Somebody's like, I don't need endurance. You're like, really? Uh, that's <laughs> let's that's do, awesome. Let's talk about your, the need for endurance. That's awesome. Right? Cause we have a lot of endurance athletes out there in our community. We have an endurance club. And I mean, when we say endurance club, we have Ironman triathlon runners, ultra marathon runners. I mean, I guess during the winter time, I know they do their bikes and their indoor runs, but like, I think that's a, that's a cool point of just jumping in the rower and just continue building that aerobic capacity. Yeah. Right. And just because you're using rowing doesn't mean that it's a rowing club because sure. you can mm -hmm. pro you can program using FTP. You can program using heart rate zones. You can program off of splits and pace. I mean, you have mm -hmm. the world is your oyster when it comes to programming. You just need a tool that's going to facilitate it. Well, the rower is very good at that. I mean, if everybody comes in with their own heart rate monitor, great. You can use heart rate training in your endurance class. But if you're like rowing club, people are like, well, I hate rowing. So why would I take that? <laughs> you know, like, and, and this is, this is time tested. Like I used to host a rowing club at Invictus. It was a very hard sell. And it yeah. wasn't until I started meeting people where they were and saying, I get it. You hate rowing. Let's stop calling it that. <laughs> Let's not say that we are learning to row because you will never care about the sport of rowing. You have no reason to, you have no connection to it unless you're going to go start rowing on the water, which, you know, Hey, some people will, and they'll find their way to it at that point. Let them fall in love with rowing yeah. while they're using the rowing machines. Just help them facilitate better performance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that's the easy yeah. way to it that's a great answer what what you may uh, agree or disagree with this one and chad you can comment too is i i've said for the people that compete in crossfit mm -hmm. i don't think you're ever going to win the workout on the rower but you can sure as heck lose it on the rower and for for, for those sure. folks that's why i said if you want to get better at the rest of the workout you'd better get good at the rower yeah yeah i agree with that yep sure i mean look at look at jackie Right. You can, you're not going to win that workout on the row. Cause if you blow yourself up, those thrusters are going to be miserable. Mm -hmm. But if you slack it on the row, you can lose enough time that somebody's going to outpace you on the thrusters and the pull-ups. Yeah, so yeah. you have to stay competitive. Like you have to stay within striking distance. And wouldn't you rather come off the rower feeling more rested, having been able to keep up without having to give everything Mm -hmm. Right. That's whenever I see Jackie, I'm like, yes. <laughs> I know that I can sit there and put out 75% yeah. and be totally on par with everybody. I know I'm going to get 50 I, deconditioned. You put a barbell in my hands. I can do 50 unbroken thrusters. Of course, deconditioned. I can jump on a pull-up bar and do 30 pull-ups unbroken right after 50 thrusters. It's just going to happen. Like mm -hmm. I know my body well enough. I know I can do that. Is it going to hurt? Yeah, absolutely. But like, I can do that, especially knowing that my row is only going to take 75% from me, not 95%. Right. If you're putting in 95% on the row, it's a razor's edge as to what's going to happen on the thrusters and the pull-ups. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you're, yeah. you know, let's say you're like a mm -hmm. low to mid-level competitive athlete. Sure, sure. Yeah. I, that sounded really egotistical. <laughs> in the, I feel like the way that that came out. No, no. Um, but that, like, that's just the point. Like if you're a, a beginning I, I, competitor, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. Again, you're, you're, you're creating efficiencies, another movement to give you better chance of recovering and better chance of being able to move through that movement, not at a peak pace. So it makes total right. sense. Makes the total way, sense. the way that I've always kind of framed it is in <clears throat> if rowing shows up in your workout and rowing. So I, I, Jackie's kind of a, the perfect example, right? Cause it's kind of like the one CrossFit workout where like everybody knows 
So for those of you that don't know, Jackie is a thousand meter row, 50 thrusters with an empty barbell and 30 pull-ups mm -hmm. per time. So if we take Jackie and we run it through the right way, rowing is the first thing. And then you have thrusters and then you have pull-ups. I will generally taper the last 10% of the row in order to prepare for the next thing. If there are other things that come after the row and right. the distance is a thousand meters or under. So if it's, let's say we took Jackie, but we made it, you know, a 500 meter row instead, mm -hmm. I would taper the final 50 meters in Jackie. I taper the final hundred meters because I know that the amount of time somebody's going to make up on me in the final hundred meters, like I'm still taking away meters, but I'm recovering that time. So in that mm -hmm. time, I'm trying to bring my heart rate down. I'm bringing my respiratory rate down. I'm making sure that when I put the handle down, finally, I'm stepping off the machine and there is no break. I'm stepping right. off, picking up the barbell and going right into thrusters without having to stand in front of it, put my hands on my hips and, you know, get myself ready to go. Yeah. So that's if, that's if we take Jackie straight through, then let's say we take Jackie and we split it in half and make it a two round workout. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now it's 500 meters, 25 pull, uh, thrusters, 15 pull-ups, two rounds through which fun little experiment. It's fun to throw that at, at your gym sometime because people like know Jackie, but all of a sudden you make it a two round workout. People are like, what? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm going to come out hot on the row in round one, but settle. I'm not going to explode through it. I'm going to taper the final 10%, 50 meters. I'm going to go do my thing. I'm going to come back to the rower. Same thing. I'm going to settle in. I'm going to taper the last 50 meters. And then I'm going to finish strong on my final thrusters and pull-ups. If you've got extra in the tank after round one, like maybe I can nudge the needle a little bit on the second row. Let's say I take Jackie and I flip it in reverse. Another fun one to throw at your gym. Mm -hmm. uh, you could do three days of Jackie. You could do Jackie forwards, Jackie two <laughs> rounds, and you could do Jackie in reverse the third day. So now you go 30 pull-ups, 50 thrusters, thousand meter row. Well, now I can win the workout on the rower. Right. Yeah. So now I go have to jam on it in the final yeah. 300 meters. So if rowing is the last thing, you can win the workout on the rower, but that's right. the only instance really in which you can, or if it's the only thing, then yeah. that's the only way you can win it on the rower. Yeah. Cool. No, that's cool. That's cool. I know I want to be conscious of your time. I did have one question. I wanted to ask you about two questions about nutrition and recovery. Um, I, I guess just, I remember the marathon row at the CrossFit games. I remember you put a video out saying like, this isn't something you just go and do, which I think is yeah. good advice. Um, yeah. I guess in, re in regards to rowing and nutrition, like, do you have anything specific from a nutrition protocol with a rower or do you sort of just look at it from just an endurance perspective, right? It's just another endurance sport. You just have to fuel up just no differently. Like if you're going to go do a marathon run. Nutritionally, I would just treat it the same as an endurance event. Cool. Yeah. You, you got You just have to make sure you're getting calories in. you have to make sure that you're keeping hydration going. The, the things that change, however, usually when it, it comes to, a large endurance event, half marathon, marathon on the rower are more. So you're like body care conditions. Those are the things okay. that change because you have to think about like a marathon run. Well, you at least get wind. So you create evaporation. Whereas like you're sitting in a box or your garage or whatever, doing a marathon row, you don't really get the benefit of evaporation. You're not going anywhere. So sweat gets become sweat management becomes a really high priority. Mm -hmm. So you should have like multiple changes of hats. I love like the, the old school baseball, like three inch forearm wristband, um, yep. sweatbands, like those three inch sweatbands will be your best friend on a, a long row, because you have to think like a lot of sweat begins right. at the armpit it, and your hands are in a downward position. That means that that sweat sweat is going to trickle down your arms into your hands. The instant your hands get damp is when you start to get blisters. Yeah. And you know, it's a, it's a repetitive friction movement. So you get you're going to mm -hmm. get blisters on your hands. Um, so the sweat management becomes high priority as well as uh, seat management. Cause if you don't have great posture, you don't have the spinal endurance to be able to maintain upright posture. And so you end up with a posterior pelvic tilt, which tends to grind the tailbone down into the seat. Now we're talking about the potential for like a really bad raspberry on your tailbone, which a raspberry sucks, but like an open wound raspberry is a absolute killer. Mm -hmm. yep, right. So seat management make, you know, the, the cheap solution has always been like, you just do a couple of rolls of bubble wrap and just put them on the seat just so that you have some air underneath you. Um, those things become high priority. 
No, that's cool. And then my my last question was like more like, how do you use rowing as a recovery tool? Or do you use rowing as a recovery tool? Yeah. I mean, the same way that you do any endurance activity that allows you to keep intensity low, you know, if you're in heart rate and you, you know, spending time in like zone two and keep that heart rate controlled. And, um, I'm, I'm a fan of heart rate as a way of capping your activity Mm -hmm, it's very mm -hmm. easy. Like if you're, if you're pretty conditioned, you get so, especially from CrossFit, you get very conditioned to be okay with like zone three, zone four heart rate. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I could just live in this forever, (laughs) but that's not really a great place to live for recovery. If you're truly trying to get in like a recovery activity. So I like using heart rate as a way of, of mitigating our comprehension of what a recovery activity is. Um, you're going to need the mechanics to go behind it though, to ensure that you are getting efficient movement in. Otherwise, you, you know, you can start to get some deterioration of movement quality. And when that starts to happen, then, you know, we're reinforcing bad habits. So the way that I've always framed it is, uh, it takes about a thousand strokes to fix a bad habit and that's roughly 10,000 meters. So for every 10,000 meters you put in, you get to work on one bad habit and correcting it. That goes both ways though. That's a two way yeah. door, right? you put in 10,000 meters with poor rowing and zero focus on, on what you're doing. Well, now you can reinforce some pretty bad habits. Um, so I like it from a perspective of it's very low impact. There's no risk. You know, you're not going to trip and fall on a rock going for a recovery run, whatever trip on a curb or a shoelace, or, um, you can keep your metrics within control. You just have to make sure you have an intention behind what you're doing as well. Awesome. Well, thanks for all the insight. I really do appreciate it. I mean, it's been great talking to you. Great learning about rowing. Um, Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Happy to chat. Thanks for uh, picking the brain. Thanks for putting the program together too. Yeah, of course. Of course. I, I, this is what I love doing. I mean, coaching is like, I see myself as a, as a coach first and that's the the beauty of this. I get to, my job is coaching. Yeah. So thank you for, thank you for having me. No problem, man. Well, thanks again. I appreciate it. Um, and yeah, uh, super excited to have the listeners listen to this thing. Cool. Sure. Awesome, Shane. Really appreciate it, man. Thank you. Absolutely. You got it. All right. Take it easy. See ya. All right. Thanks, Shane. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully that was okay. useful.